All right, welcome. We have a, a unique discussion tonight. We've not had a textual scholar on. We've had a lot of discussions with philosophers, theologians, uh, but tonight Dr. James Snap joins me. I've been watching his videos consistently as I drive from Tennessee to Florida. Uh, so I got through quite a few of them and I've got a bunch of notes, but uh, thank you, Dr. Snap, for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, before we get started here, uh, what are we, we want, I'm going to have a link below to your YouTube channel so people can find you there. And then you mentioned a couple other blogs and sites that uh, people need to check out. What were those? Uh, at the, uh, www.thetextofthegospels is my blog site. Well, you just disappeared. What happened? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'll keep talking. Can you see me? I can see you. We're good. Okay. Okay. I'm, I must have uh, linked out momentarily. There you are. Okay. I'm just going to put you on widescreen. Hold oh, on. Okay. Okay. Where were we? Oh, yeah. Uh, thetextofthegospels.com is my blog. And also at uh, curtisvillecc.com. There's a special section there that says uh, resources for New Testament textual, textual criticism. And that will have a, a list of buttons. And each one of those buttons will take a person uh, to that particular topic. This is great because uh, not a lot of people know a lot about textual studies. We learn a lot about the Bible. We get into the text. But a lot of people don't know about the history of the text, uh, why textual studies is important, uh, the basics of it even a lot of people are ignorant of. Um, I would by no means class myself as an expert or anything like that, but I've read a lot of patristics and I've done a lot of, uh, of the theological studies. So maybe you could give us an introduction into the, the ideas of textual studies and why it matters and some of the basic concepts here. Well, the, uh, the goal of uh, the traditional goal of New Testament textual criticism in any field, it, it doesn't have to be the reconstruction of, of a biblical text, but any, any text in, in textual criticism, the, the goal is to reconstruct the text of the original documents. Now, there's, you, you could say that there's been, in the past 40 years or so, an, an emphasis on a secondary goal, which is almost becoming to some scholars the, the primary goal. And that is that uh, by looking at various kinds of readings, you can detect the scribal habits of the copyists. And sometimes there'll be a particular reading that will indicate what was going on in the, in the church when that reading arose. And so there's also a, a secondary uh, purpose of textual, textual cr criticism to, uh, to, to evaluate the uh, influence of various controversies and needs of the church, and how, how that had an effect on, on the text. But certainly the main goal, I think the, the, the number one goal, number two goal, number three goal uh, for, for, for most people is the reconstruction of the original text. And I think a lot of people, too, might be a misunderstanding when people hear uh, uh, inerrancy or authority of scriptures, these kinds of doctrines, which I, I definitely believe. They might think that, well, where is that text? Can I go view that and put it under a microscope? But um, what we typically mean is the autographa, that that's the uh, one that we consider to be the uh, inspired text, but we don't have that. So what we're kind of relying on is, as you pointed out, the notions of reconstructions, is that correct? I'm not sure I quite, quite caught that last bit. Can you say that again? So what we're relying on is not a specific um, text that we could point to to say, well, here is the codex that is the inspired one. We're saying that there is an autographa of the apostles, that we don't actually have that specific one, but we can still believe in inerrancy and the authority of the scriptures based on the fact that the, the text has uh, its, its authority and its veracity handed down in the church. Yes. Uh, if, if, if we had an autograph, it'd be game over for uh, textual te right. te criticism yeah. and, and, and in a good sense. And with that, what would you mean? If we had the, the original document, we could just say, well, here, here it is right here. Uh, rest and be happy. But uh, since we have multiple copies and there's no copy that, this, that agrees exactly with all, with all the others to a great extent, uh, I, I mean, well, not, not to, to, to a great extent, but just uh, how, how to phrase it. In all the major witnesses, we have various transmission lines. Okay. And in each transmission line, there are variants that can, that can be uh, calculated, that can be counted 
but they can also be uh, categorized in different groups. The idea is that uh, when, when, when manuscripts have a certain reading in common, uh, especially if it's a, a reading that is clearly non-original, uh, the, the, when, when a reading arises that is unique to a particular group of readings, and then there's another reading that's also particular, particular to that group of excuse, excuse me, that group of manuscripts. When a bunch of manuscripts agree on the same group of readings, that implies they have a history in right. common. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. So, so the basic idea here is that um, a lot of people will look at these things and they they aren't uh, aware of the transmission history. But I think you gave a good sort of introduction where you talked about the different types of, um, how did you word it? I'm trying to remember, I've got it listed here. You talked about, so there's manuscripts, there's versions, there's lectionaries, there's a patristic witness, and then you then there's the sort of miscellaneous category of tombstones and this kind of stuff. So could you tell us about some of those and, and, and how they play into this, how they work, why they matter? Well, the, uh, the Greek manuscripts would probably be the uh, the main uh, go-to source for the text, because that's where you know, the continuous Greek text is. And But the, the, the uh, patristic witnesses are also extremely important. When you can look in a patristic composition, and you know when the, the writer wrote it, and you know where he wrote it, and when, uh, you can pretty much, that, that, that gives you a, a foundation for the history of the variants that that writer uses. You can, you can say, as, as if we're sure about the, the text of the patristic writer, then we can be sure about the text that he was using. So even though the, the manuscripts of the patristic writers themselves might not be particularly early, but their echoes when, of well, when that document was written, for instance, I, I, Irenaeus, Origen, these uh, many, many other writers, as long as we can confirm their, their text, it's sort of like finding a, an old papyrus manuscript embedded in that composition. It's not on papyrus anymore, but uh, when that writer wrote, uh, the text that he was using was, fr was from a, a manuscript of that caliber, that, that age. Right. Um, and then you mentioned the different versions and the lectionaries. Are these kind of lesser important, but uh, they do vindicate, they do have an attestation power? Is that how that works? Yeah, the, uh, the versions are extremely important for tracking the scope of particular readings. Uh, for instance, if we have a manuscript from, say, Ireland in the 700s, and we have a manuscript from Egypt about the same time, and they both agree on a relatively rare reading, uh, that gives us, that, that that raises a question about, you know, how did this reason, how did this reading get over there to Ireland when we see right. it earlier here in Egypt? Uh, that, that that's a question that should be investigated. Okay. And, uh, also, and then, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Go also, ahead. when we see uh, readings that are everywhere, uh, for, for instance, I like to compare it to the to the branches of a tree. If you have a tree, and um, I'm not I'm not really familiar myself with with tree grafting, but uh, you know, gra grafting an orange tree to a lemon tree, or grafting a lemon branch to an orange tree. But uh, if you could picture something like that happening and compare it to the transmission lines of the New Testament text, you would have uh, here's the tree. Here's the branches. There's a branch here, there's a branch here, there's a branch here, there's a branch here. Now on this one particular branch, there might be, you know, that, that branch might get a lot of sunshine, and there might be more, more fruit on it than any of the other branches put together. So, right. so in terms of simple number, that branch has the most fruit. But suppose that on the, all the other branches, you have a different kind of fruit. When, when you came to that tree and you said, well, what kind of tree was this originally? Would you just say, well, let's just count the fruit, in which case we would be giving an inordinate amount of authority or, or, or weight, you could say, yes. to one particular branch. Right. Or do you say, well, let's count the branches. When you look at the versions, that helps you have a better idea of what the early branches were that you can't get if you ignore them. I see. Now, <clears throat> you made an interesting statement too. I don't want to. I want to. I don't remember the exact phrase that you used, but you said that it's not always necessarily just because a text is the oldest that it's the most valuable. Because you could have an older text that's perhaps corrupted or not that accurate. 
uh, but other texts that might be a little bit later could have a better consistency. Uh, maybe something you, you, I mean, you phrase it. I don't remember how you phrase it, but it was something along those lines. Yes, I, I would say uh, what what it really comes down to is how well did the copyist do their job? Because um, okay. there because there can be bad copyist in, inaccurate. Right. By, by, by bad, I don't mean evil. I mean careless. Right. Uh, there, there can be a, a careless copyist at any time. Uh, copyists can get sleepy. They can just get inattentive. They can just not care. Um, and we see that in particularly uh, some of the Western lines. Uh, when you look at an, an old Latin manuscript like a Codex Babiensis, you think, was this guy drunk the whole time? What was, how did this reading, how did this happen? And, um, and that's a relatively old manuscript. That's one of the oldest old Latin witnesses. And um, when we look at relatively old manuscripts, like some of the major, the major uncials, um, like Sinaiticus, and say you compare, uh, well, pick, pick a chapter, any, any of the first eight chapters of John, compare that text to, say, a medieval copy from the 1300s, and just, uh, just pick any 20-verse section and see which one lines up more closely with the Nestle Allen uh, compilation. Or, or you could take a Codex D, which is supposed to be from the, from the 400s, I would say later than what, what David Parker would say earlier. Um, but the text is the main thing. And looking at that text, um, I mean, again, pick your medieval manuscript at random and compare that to Codex D and ask which one is more accurate, the medieval manuscript from the 1300s, 1400s? Yes. Or this old Codex D from maybe right. early 400s? I would say more likely late, late 400s. But no matter how you slice it, though, you'll see that the medieval manuscript has a much better, sometimes, right. sometimes no, by, I mean, so, sometimes Codex D gets lapped three times in, in terms of accuracy. Wow. Uh, Co Co Codex D's text is far inferior right. to the medieval mini schools, uh, using as the standard of comparison, the Nestle Allen uh, Greek New Testament. If the Byzantine text were used as the standard of comparison, Codex D would be even further behind. Mm -hmm. That's a good uh, uh, question to ask there is, uh, do you, you notice that scholars sometimes have a, an assumption or a presupposition that's not really justified that something is better because it's older and it may not necessarily be? Does that happen? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it, it does happen sometimes. You often see, uh, uh, look, look at Bill, Bill Mounts' materials. I think you'll, it's easy to see in, in some of his uh, comments. There's just a natural assumption that older is better. Right. Really? Okay. And uh, really, um, unless you're taking an old manuscript and pretty much adopting its text, it's hard to find a manuscript where you can say, oh, that really is better, because yeah. so many of the older manuscripts uh, clearly deviate in, in large degrees from even what uh, the pro-Alexandrian uh, school of thought would, would say is the original text. Uh, now, uh, this will be old hat to you, but just for the sake of the audience, because a lot of people on my channel will know about some of the church fathers, they'll know about theological ideas, they'll know about philosophy, they'll know about, uh, you know, New Testament arguments and, and, and uh, con concepts, but a lot of people might not be even familiar with Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex, you know, these different codices. Could you tell us a couple of the, the key ones and why they matter and why you hear those referred to so often? Sure. Um, now, um, it might be a little complicated to get into the papyri, but uh, to focus on Vaticanus and uh, Sinaiticus first, and then we can maybe, maybe we rewind from there. Okay. Uh, Vaticanus is pretty much the major basis where, where it's extant, where, where, where it exists, because there are some books where it's just not there. But um, Codex Vaticanus is pretty much the basis, the, the definitely far and away the primary basis for the Nestle Island uh, compilation. Um, and it's in the Vatican, that's why it's called Vaticanus. But it's just one of many manuscripts at, at the Vatican Library. It's been there since the late 1400s, since there was a Vatican Library. And um, Codex Vaticanus is definitely an Alexandrian text. And if we focus on the Gospels especially, uh, we, we see that it's uh, probably the flagship manuscript of that form of the text. And uh, that was regarded back in the 1800s by, by two scholars named Westcott and Hort, and by others before them, uh, Trigel, Trigels and, and Penn, who also gets overlooked. Um, it was regarded as 
pr pretty much the definitive text. Uh, it's rather rare when there's a deviation from B where B is not being spectacularly wrong in some way. Um, George, George uh, Salmon, uh, who was a contemporary of Westcott and Hort, uh, mentioned that uh, Westcott and Hort had this uh, dependence on Vaticanus that was extreme. Um, one, one was, by the way, that they tried to describe its text was as the neutral text, except when it's not neutral. Right. And, um, and that, that nomenclature has not aged well. Mm. But, um, but West Carolina Hoyt uh, leaned very heavily on Vaticanus, and Sinaticus was kind of there like the backup quarterback um, or, the, or the sidekick. Okay. So it's, like, it's nice to have Vaticanus, excuse me, it's nice to have Sinaticus along to reinforce uh, Vaticanus. But Vaticanus is really the go-to manuscript. Uh, even when there are older manuscripts, like the, in, in the papyri, uh, Vaticanus still gets preferred most of the time. Uh, you could make the observation that, you no, know, West Cotton and Hort didn't have all the papyri. They, they had what? One. And uh, so pe people sometimes try to spin the papyri to say, well, now we have the papyri. It's different now. But when you look at the actual texts, they're not really very different between mm -hmm. 1997 Nestle Island and 1881 Westcott Hort. Uh, one of my blog posts makes a direct comparison of those two, and uh, you can see the, the, the data that I've co compiled and the data that uh, J.K. Elliott has compiled indicates you know, there's, there's not that many changes. There's, there's a lot more brackets, but uh, not that many real changes to the text that are substantial. Now we hear uh, uh, sometimes mention the uh, received text, the Byzantine text, the patriarchal text. Um, how do those relate to the ones that you've mentioned? Um, well, the, the Byzantine text is a complete, is a, well, not com completely different. I mean, obviously these are all the same books in the Bible. Right. But the Byzantine text is a different transmission line from what Vaticanus represents. Okay. The Codex Sinaiticus also, like, uh, like Vaticanus, represents more or less the Alexandrian line. Uh, okay. I, again, pretty much all my general descriptions, just assume that I'm talking about the Gospels, don't assume that when I'm talking about the Gospels, I mean, this is the way it also is in the general epistles. Or this is the way it is in, in Revelation. It's, it's important to, uh, to, to look at di different genres of the books uh, individually, okay. like Gospels, Acts, right. Epistles, General Epistles, Revelation. Um, I, mean, I mean, for Vaticanus, Revelation is not even there in the manuscript because, because of damage. It's, it's, uh, it, it was... Not unusual for New Testament codices, even even big, you know, full New Testaments, to not have Revelation in them. Revelation usually got its own volume. Oh, okay. But um, but in in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, you have a distinct form that seems to be generated in a particular locale. If it wasn't in Egypt, it was you no know, in a manuscript that came from Egypt. For instance, uh, there's a st strong theory that Sinaiticus was made at in the city, in the scriptorium, uh, scriptorium is a, a manuscript making center at the, the city of, of Caesarea, which of course is not in Egypt, but, uh, but it's close to Egypt. And we know that uh, from, from historical accounts, unless the historians were lying, I don't, I don't think they were, of course, but uh, the, the origin you know, from Egypt moved to Caesarea and took his manuscripts with him. He had, he had you know, a couple of manuscripts uh, collections co combined. And um, so it wouldn't be surprising to find Alexandrian manuscripts at Caesarea, mm -hmm. even though geographically it's not Egyptian, but in terms of the character of the text, that carries forth wherever the manuscript goes, whether it's physically in Egypt or not. So it would be surprising to find at Caesarea uh, Alexandrian manuscripts. And um, the, the, and uh, not to go into too much detail, but there are some indications within the text itself of, of Sinaiticus that uh, are, are very consistent with a Caesarean point of origin for it. Now, Vaticanus is a different story. It doesn't have that, that kind of clue. So it's more of a mystery exactly where it came from. But if you look at the earliest Sahidic version in the book of Acts, in, in Acts chapter 27, where it describes you know, how many souls were there on board that ship, mm -hmm. the, in the, the story of the, the shipwreck, and uh, the book of, excuse me, the, the, uh, the, the text of Vaticanus has a variant there that is very unusual, but it agrees with the Sahidic version in a very unusual way. You have to make a particularly 
unusual kind of mistake to come up with a reading that's in both Vaticanus mm. and in the Sahidic version. So there's a definite, definite strong connection there. Um, and that's what, another reason why the versions are so important, that you can see connections between where that kind of text was used. Not necessarily where it originated. Um, for instance, when we talk about the Western text, it doesn't mean that the text had to have come from the yep. West. It just means it was used dominantly there. I see. So when we have the, the Alexandrian Greek text, and we also have the Alexandrian Sahidic text, it indicates where is the locale of that Greek text? Where did it come from? Yeah. Uh, we can see it originally in Egypt. And that gives the Alexandrian text one advantage. And that is the weather. In Egypt, the weather is very, or, well, in parts of Egypt, the weather is very dry. Yes. Okay. And that dryness, that lack of humidity, lets papyrus last a very, very long time. Whereas, say, if you go up to Turkey, to Greece, to Antioch, to practically any other location where that doesn't happen to be a bog, um, you will see the, the, the papyrus right away. Uh, we don't find papyrus anywhere else. It's not just, we don't find papyrus copies of books of the Bible. We don't find papyrus receipts. We don't find papyrus books of any kind. We don't, we don't, yeah. the, 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 it, it's very rare. I mean, there are some exceptions, but, um, but it's very rare to see a papyrus anywhere outside of Egypt. Right. Uh, virtually all of the papyri, and again, you can just throw in the words, there are some exceptions to just about everything that is going to be a, ma a main topic here. But, um, but the predominant, the overwhelming number of papyri are all from the same locale because everywhere else, papyrus would just naturally rot away. It was just too, too damp everywhere else. Yeah. That gives Egypt the advantage of having the oldest manuscripts. So if a person says, Is, doesn't it make sense to follow the oldest manuscripts? Mm -hmm. well, if you do that, you're going to see the text like it was in Egypt practically guaranteed wherever there's an extant manuscript from Egypt, because that's where manuscripts just would naturally last the longest. The thing is, those manuscripts from Egypt might tell you a pretty good idea about what the text was like in Egypt, mm. but they're not going to necessarily tell you what the text was like anywhere else, in all the churches you know, yeah. outside of Egypt, which would include all the churches mentioned in the New Testament. Right. Good point. One of the things I remember uh, F.F. Bruce saying was that there is a large amount of attestation to the veracity of the New Testament text. And so he mentioned, I think, uh, some 5,000 plus manuscripts. Now, this was an older book he had written in probably the 60s or 70s that I read many years ago. And But he was saying that, that you know, when we compare the New Testament documents and how they have this high level of attestation to other ancient documents, we find really uh, an unparalleled um, degree and number of, of, you know, other sources and things that point to it. Nothing like this in the ancient world. I think he says something to that effect. Um, is that still the case as a scholar? Would you agree with that kind of an assessment that, uh, this, you know, if you look at Plato, you know, Plato's got these late medieval, uh, documents that attest to, to his stuff. Is there, is there a, a large amount of stuff that attests to the veracity of the New Testament? Because people throw this up all the time that, well, these are ancient books, and how do you know it's not all the, you know, copied wrong and this kind of stuff, right? Yeah, there, there are a lot of New Testament manuscripts. However, uh, I would say the uh, embarrassment of Richard's line has been badly oversold. And uh, what I mean by that is that First, many of the statistics that will be used by apologists are terribly obsolete. And uh, myths and mistakes would be one place to look to see, see a, uh, an example of the, the update. That's a, a recent book. Of that, 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 that is one of the things that is addressed in that book. But um, Myths and mistakes, is that what you said? Myths and mistakes, yeah. Um, okay. I have a copy of, over, over there. Okay. But uh, myths, myths and mistakes uh, addresses that very point of, can we really say it's this much better? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is, in the New Testament, you've got 27 books, and the attestation is not the same for every book. Mm -hmm. so I have no 1,800 copies of the Gospel of John. Okay, you got some pretty, pretty good, that's pretty good. How about, how about Titus? How about Revelation? How, how, far, how far back does the oldest manuscript go, and how much of it is there? 
uh, when we say we have a thousand manuscripts, one thing we don't overlook is that the littlest itty bittiest little tidbit morsel of a manuscript gets its own manuscript number. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when uh, Dan Wallace's first century mark that wasn't first century mark uh, was finally released, we saw what a little bitty thing it is. Fragment, yeah. A fragment, yeah. And every fragment, though, gets its own number. And so it's really easy to say, well, we have this many manuscripts, but you know, trace it back. And lots of those are fragments. Uh, okay. so, so, so it's like, well, if, if that's valid, then, then you, you, you can start with a 10 big New Testaments complete, a repeats one and a half, and then you got twice as many. Fair um, enough. <laughs> So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Some of them are fragments. Also, right. some, a, lot of, a lot of them are, are, are late. And again, uh, late does not necessarily mean bad. Right. Late does not necessarily be, be, mean, mean inaccurate. It all comes down to how well did the scribes do their job. And um, well, One of the arguments F.F. Bruce makes was that by comparison to Plato, there's a lot more that attests to the New Testament. Would you say that that's a valid argument? Compared to the manuscripts, ancient manuscripts of, of Plato? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Sure. But, um, but bear in mind, um, Kurt Allen, you know, as in Nussel Allen, uh, Kurt Allen uh, made a point of pointing out, you know, we don't really care about the Byzantine manuscripts. You, mm-hmm. you can open his he- textbooks and see what he says. And he plainly says, you know, Byzantine manuscripts, they don't really have that much to do with reconstructing the text of the New Testament. Uh, those Byzantine manuscripts, they all represent that later text, the text that was used by the church, the, the Alexandrian text. That's, that's the real go-to text. Right. That, that's our basis. And if you look at his compilation, it's constructed in, in accord with that, with that assumption. Uh, so yes. overwhelmingly, even though on the one hand, the apologist will say, well, we have you know, almost 5,000 manuscripts. Right. Right. But, 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 but then zoom in on the textual critic like, like Alan, and Alan will say, yeah, we have 5,000, but we pretty much totally ignore 4,900 of them. <laughs> so, so in effect, yeah, you've got that number out there, and that number might sound good when a person is being an apologist, but yeah. that same person is turning to the task of textual criticism. Is he going to adopt the readings of those 5,000 when Sinaiticus and Vaticanus say something else? Interesting. So, yeah, so it gets more nuanced there. Um, so how do we view the, the Byzantine text in that regard? How, how would you view it? Well, maybe it'd be easier to say how I don't view it, to give me an idea of how, how the text, that's the base text of, say, the ESV or the NIV, how, how those texts came together. But right. West Cotton Hort um, built on the foundations that were laid by, by scholars before them by proposing that early in the 300s, um, somebody, maybe a guy named Lucian of Antioch, maybe not, uh, made the Byzantine text. Uh, the, the basic theory of the Lucianic recension was an intrinsic part of Westcott and Hort's approach. The idea is that before the year 300, more or less, you have the Alexandrian text, which was this really superb, excellent text in Egypt. And you have evidence in many other places of the Western text, which is which they consider a a rather elaboratizing, fancier, more flourish-filled, more harmonizing, in other words, basically more inaccurate uh, form of the text, the Western text. And they said these, these two earlier texts, the Alexandrian text and the Western text, were blended together by somebody around the year 300, and that's how the, the Byzantine text began. The, the idea was when we see a unique reading in the Byzantine text, uh, we don't see it in any of the patristic writings before the year 300. The implication that Hort would, would draw from that is we don't see them because those readings weren't there. Yeah. Unique Byzantine readings, re- readings in the Byzantine text that are neither Western nor Alexandrian, those came into being at that point. Therefore, any Byzantine reading that's uniquely Byzantine that is neither Western nor, nor Alexandrian they would say automatically, that's out of here. Okay. That was part of the fundamental approach. And it was based on that theory that the Byzantine text is a created text, that it's a recension. It right. wasn't a you know, made, made, one, made at one point and, and set in stone. 
But that was the basic foundation of their approach, which basically that, that assumption then leads to the premise that all those readings in the Byzantine text that are not Alexandrian or Western, we, we throw those out. Well, then what do you do when you go back a step and it's Alexandrian versus Western? The Byzantine text agrees with the Western text quite a bit. Mm. They would say, well, the Alexandrian text is intrinsically better. So we'll ignore those Western readings as well. And that leaves the Alexandrian text as the last man standing to look for the go-to place for the original text. Huh. That was Hort's theory, basically. Now, right. obviously, I've summed, some, summed up some things again. Uh, readers that might want to look into this more can, can read the 1897 Oxford debate on textual criticism. It, it's a free download online. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going to get you to, if you could, recommend some, some of the key books that you want us to read uh, when we come to the end. But um, one of the things that you recently addressed was a Reformed uh, professor who was dealing with the end of Mark. And of course, this is a big thing that comes up all the time. What about the end of Mark? Um, if you're discussing with Muslims, Muslims will often bring this up as, oh, look at uh, people saying that this is an addition. It doesn't belong there. Therefore, the Bible's not inspired, this kind of stuff which overlooks nuance, but uh, you made some really uh, interesting arguments that I had not heard about Mark, <clears throat> where when you, responding to, a, a, is it Dr. Kruger, was that his name? That, that's one of several. Yeah. Okay. Well, but you, you were pointing out that some of the things that we want to look for is fallacies, fallacy of consensus, the patristic testimony. Um, I really liked that you went to uh, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Augustine, Eusebius, um, that was all very fascinating. I, I, that was all new to me. So you want to maybe give us an overview of that? Oh, sure. Uh, in lots of Bibles, especially like the, well, the NIV, the CSB, you'll, you'll right. see somewhere around Mark, Mark 16, 9, a footnote or a heading note that says, some early manuscripts don't have verses 9 through 20. Now, the NIV used to say, you know, the most reliable manuscripts don't, and then they, they toned down the rhetoric a little bit. But um, when we look at the manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark, of which there are over 1,600, um, how many is it missing in? How, how many is there just not a single word of Mark 16, 9 through 20? How many, how many just have nothing after 16, 8? Um, three. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And um, I have something rel relevant to this uh, laying around here somewhere. But... Uh, yeah, somewhere. But the, um, so, so when it says some, what it means is, you know, of the extant ones, the ones that exist, mm -hmm. two. Because the third one is not really a continuous text manuscript. It's a commentary manuscript where you've got you know, some text, commentary, text, commentary. It, the, it, it's split up. And, um, and at the end, it, it just comes to a stop, and the commentary is not done either. So that... Medieval one, number 304, uh, I have a blog post about it, at the text of the Um uh, It's kind of out there. It, it does end at 16.8, but it looks like, man, we can't really tell. No, there's, there's no subscription. It just, I mean, there's a little poem. Yeah. There's no, here is the end of the Gospel of Mark. It, it's just, it just, <laughs> right. it stops rather than, than it concludes, you could say. Uh, now, as for uh, Codex uh, Vaticanus, uh, here again, I go to my uh, blog posts. Uh, I have one that's specifically on Codex Sinaiticus and the ending of the Gospel of Mark, and another one that's on Codex Vaticanus and the ending of the Gospel of Mark. In Codex Vaticanus, um, typically, the copyist ended a book and then would start the next book at the top of the next column. All throughout the New Testament, we see, we see this without variation. And in the Old Testament, we see some variation, for instance, at the end of the whole Old Testament portion, before the New Testament starts, obviously, you know, there's, there's a break. But the only other kind of variations there are is when there was some quirk involved in the production of the book that required a break. Like, like when the poetic books switch from this number of columns to only two columns. Okay. okay. you you got to break there because you're, you're, you're changing the format of the pages. Right. Um, I, th I think Daniel Wallace had said, oh, we can't tell why the scribes changed, left, left these blanks in the Old Testament portion. You most definitely can tell. You can tell why they did it. It's not hard at all. And, um, but here at the end of Mark, you have Mark on one page, Luke on the next side, 
But between the end of Mark 16, 8, and the beginning of Luke chapter 1, verse 1, there is an entire blank column besides the, besides the space left in the, col- in, the th- in the middle column after the end of Mark 16. Okay. Now, uh, there's a, exactly uh, enough space there to fill that space with uh, verses 9 through 20. And if anybody doubts me on this, if anybody says, you know, if, if anybody out there is saying, oh, there used to be a theory that this space would, 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 would be filled with uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20, if you doubt this, just go to my blog post. I have a graphic right there that anybody can access. Okay, anybody I'll have can links access, to those. Yeah, I'll put those links. Go online, look at it. Every single letter in my reconstruction, I cut and paste from elsewhere on the same page. Mm-hmm. So copyists knew how to crowd their text a little bit. We see the copyists of Codex Sinaiticus do this very thing in the opening chapter of Luke. Interesting. Um, so when you look at that blank space and you know, hmm, this was a place where there was a question about, no, does this text belong here? Does this text not belong there? And you see this blank space, uh, it's amazing how far-fetched the theories can be about why is this blank space here? We have no idea. <laughs> or, or it must have been, you know, pre- pretty much the people have come up with anything but a memorial space. Uh, okay. when, when I say memorial space, I probably should define that. Okay. In Codex L, an important uh, answer, answer, in Codex L, um, when in John, where it comes to the story of the woman caught in adultery, uh, it comes to the text right before that, and then we see this blank space. It's like the copyist remembered, I'm sure something goes here, Yeah. but in his master copy, it wasn't there. And he wasn't quite sure what the, what the person owning the manuscript eventually would, would, would want to do there. So he left some space, you know, just in case somebody wants to put this in there, I'm, I'm sure there was something there. Uh, we see that both in Codex L, we also see it in Codex Delta. In Codex Vaticanus, that's what we see at the end of Mark, memorial space. It's, it's like the, the copy is just saying, I'm making this copy, but this is not going to be my copy. This copy is going somewhere else. Mm. I don't have any instructions from the boss about what to do here. I see. Mm. So I'll keep my options open by leaving the space, the space open. Yeah. Okay. Leave the space open. And that way, if somebody later on wants to add in the verses, here's your space. And if somebody wants to just close it off right here, they can just write the subscription. Write the subscription. I'll put the subscription back. By subscription, I just mean the closing title of the book. Yeah. They put the book titles after the book. Right. And, um, and so they, they, they left their options open. And that's why you see that blank space in Vaticanus. Sinaiticus is equally suggestive. Uh, when you look at Sinaiticus, the, the only other one of the true early manuscripts, the Greek, Greek, Greek manuscripts, I mean, the only other one of the Greek manuscripts that doesn't have any of Mark 69 through 20, um, its copyist was a bit more aggressive. Mm-hmm. He made a decision to not have a Mark 69 through 20, but also to not make it look like there was going to be a blank space left for it. Because the uh, supervisor, the, the, the uh, diathotes, the corrector, the, 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 the boss of the scriptorium, um, he's proofreading the pages of Sinaiticus. He sees somewhere on the, on the, the, the leaf, the, 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 fol- the folio that uh, has the, the end of Mark and the beginning of Luke, some yeah. kind of bad mistake. No. Now, I don't think that Mark 16, 9 through 20 was in those pages, the non-extant pages. Right. But, but there was a, some kind of bad mistake that was messed up in Luke. And I know that seems counterintuitive because we, we, we see it, but, but if you go through the math, and again, that's why I wrote the blog post, so I don't have to say, say the same yeah, thing. Also. But, um, <clears throat> but basically, the original pages of Vaticanus, are, 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 it, it, maybe it is not to say original, but to say the, uh, the pages made by the main scribe, the pages that are, you see in, in the manuscript as it exists today, the copyist that wrote the pages before the end of Mark, and the copyist that wrote the pages after the, after the opening pages of, of Luke, of, that's not the same copyist who made the pages on which Mark ends. These are replacement pages, the pages that are there in the manuscript now, the pages that, that were in the manuscript when it left the scriptorium. 
Those were made by the corrector. His job was to uh, pr proofread it, and when he comes to a mistake, he fixes it. Sometimes you can fix a little mistake just by writing it out, but when you come to a major mistake, you've got to replace four pages. Not just the page the mistake is on, but also the other part of the manuscript, because these are all pages folded up like, like, like a bulletin. You've got to replace that, that whole sheet. So you've got to rewrite the page of, page of text over here and rewrite the text over here. And you can see in Luke where he is compacting his text. His, his lettering is very much compacted. Any, anybody can go to Tzadakis because it's, it's open to view at a website. Look at those pages, count up the numbers of letters per line, the number of letters per column, and you can see he's squishing his text together there in Luke. What has happened is that when he was making the correction page, he started in Luke and smooth, smooth together the text of Luke. Okay, that's all fine. The, the, the text lines up. So, so the, correct, the, the replacement page is the text lines up just right with the beginning of the next page. So, it's, so you can say, okay, I don't have to wor worry about whether or not these, co these columns are going to be okay. They're fine. Now let's go back and do, do Luke. Excuse me. Let's go back and do Mark. So he goes back and is working on Mark, but along the way, uh, he loses track of what he's doing and starts to write at his normal rate of letters per column. He's no longer smushing his letters at one point. He starts out smushing his letters, but then it changes. But by smushing, uh, you could say the technical term, compacting might be a better word, or compressing okay. his letters together. But it's the same thing. And so, um, so at one point he, he forgets what he's doing, then he says, oh, wait, I forgot what I'm doing, I better, better start compacting my letters again. Along the way, in verse in chapter sixteen, the beginning of the chapter, he make he he makes a mistake. This is the corrector, the the the, the, the boss of the scriptorium, but uh, but he he makes a mistake, and thus loses a certain amount of letters. Now, if he hadn't lost his train of thought, and if he hadn't lost those letters at the beginning of chapter sixteen, he would have come to the end of Mark sixteen eight in the first column of the next page. But then you would have this gap, a full blank column, before Luke begins. So what he did was, at that point, instead of compressing his letters, like you see him doing you know, in Luke, he says, well, I, I better stretch this text out. And so you can see, I, I, and again, just go to the manuscript, anybody can see it, count the letters, you'll see this. He starts to stretch his letters out. Uh, it was it was traditional for copyists to abbreviate or contract the name of the name Jesus. Uh, whenever you see the name of Jesus, it's very very rare that a manuscript ever actually writes out the name of Jesus Christ. It's, it's considered a sacred name, and so so it's co contracted. But the copyist, the, the the corrector, writes out Jesus' name in Mark sixteen six. Why? Because he's trying to stretch out the letters so, his, so he won't have a text end in that column, so he'll have enough text to throw onto the next column so it will look ordinary so there won't be this suggestive column anymore. Right. Uh, now that's complex, and that's why I wrote the blog post so anybody can walk through it and, and okay. see what's going on there in Sinaiticus. But, what uh, about a couple, a, a couple other uh, controversial places? Well, before we leave the Mark thing, um, in, your, in your view, there is uh, a reasonable argument for its inclusion, correct? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and and uh, on, on that note, uh, I have written a, a research book on the, sub, on the subject. Uh, yeah, I remember you saying you had a book. It's, yeah. uh, it's available in the, new, in the NT Textual Criticism group. It's a free download. It's a free download in some, on, on some other groups. Uh, it's on Amazon. You can, uh, Amazon doesn't let you just give things away, but you can get, get a copy for 99 cents. Yeah, there, you have no. Or you can just well, I would say support your work and purchase it. Yeah. Email me and I'll send you a copy. <laughs> when you have a manuscript, and when you have a text, um, even, even if it has some internal oddities to it, uh, if it's in 99.9% .9 of your manuscripts, if it's in patristic yeah. writing yeah. all the way from Ireland to right. Armenia, I mean, I can't, I can't stretch far enough to convey how much patristic evidence there is for this passage. Right. Um, when, when it's when you see it in so many early versions, when you see it in over 40 patristic writers from the, from the, from the era of the Roman Empire, um, these things should matter. This is evident. Right. This, this is I not, agree. I like the Turks Receptus. This is ancient evidence that people need to pay attention to. And seeing a footnote that says, some of the manuscripts don't have verses 9 through 20, that raises doubts that, that, that don't, aren't really allowed to go anywhere when people say, 
just how, how many is that sum? Well, it, does any, can anybody, can anyone that makes the ESV or the, or the CBD, can they count to three? Why don't they? Because <laughs> they know that being precise would hurt their case. Oh, uh, interesting. What about those other kind of uh, uh, debated places like the woman caught in adultery in John 8 or the Yohanin comma? What's your, your view on those? Um, can I take those in reverse order? Sure. Uh, regarding the uh, the 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 Yohannin comma, uh, and this is in First John five seven, seven, seven through eight, um, I think it's very clear if you look at the evidence that the Yohannin comma originated in the old Latin transmission line. It was never a part of the Greek text. Um, later, later in the Middle Ages, and there were some copies that were influenced by Latin, that like that, what's called a diglot, where you have Greek over here, but there's another version beside it. And when you have that happen, sometimes there'll be what's called retro translation, which is instead of the Greek, like, like, like you would think should always happen, the Greek should influence the version. The version shouldn't influence the Greek. Mm -hmm. but sometimes the version did influence right. the Greek. Okay. And what you have happen is what's called retro translation. The Greek text is conformed to match up to the version, especially when it's the old Latin version. I see. And our form of Latin that's been influenced by the, by, 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 from the Vulgate that's been influenced by the by the old Latin. Um, if you look in what's called the the anonymous uh, Scottish or Irish uh, commentator, uh, who doesn't have the uh, the comment in his text, but he still draws a an analogy uh, between the, the the spirit, the water, and the blood. But uh, you'll you'll see the order of those witnesses is is transposed. Whenever you see the 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 uh, the spirit, the water, the the the, the father, the son, the son. The, Father, the Word. I always do myself. The Father, the Word, and, and the Holy Spirit. When you when you see those three in the text, look ahead a little bit to the next verse, and look at the order of the earthly witnesses. Mm -hmm. You'll see the more you in, in the early evidence where you see the the comma, you'll also see a, a transposition. You'll you'll see that. Uh, First comes water. The water is, you know, then the commentator would say, the water represents the Father, just like in Jeremiah, I am the fountain of living waters. Okay. And then, of course, the Spirit is the Spirit, and then the blood, obviously, for Christ. And so this transposition in the old Latin text kind of opened the door, let, rolled out the red carpet to say, please interpret me as a Trinitarian uh, analogy. Okay. Well, some, that's exactly what somebody did, and that analogy became so popular that it was put into the old Latin text. But if you look at the Greek manuscripts, old, middle age, young, there's no way the comma, the, the, the comma is, has even remotely a chance of being original in the Greek text. Interesting. And, and what about John eight with the woman in adultery? Um, that one is complex, a lot more complex than Mark because in the case of Mark 16, 9 20, we have, as far as Greek manuscripts are concerned, three manuscripts, one of which is a medieval commentary, two of which have clear anomalies betraying their, their scribes' awareness of the missing verses. I wouldn't think that would be too hard when you have so many patristic writers affirming Mark 16, mm -hmm. 20, particularly some in the second century, before Vatican, long before, before Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were made. Uh, Irenaeus quotes Mark 16, 19. For instance, yeah. uh, we see Tatian looking at looking at his his diatessaron. We see witnesses for the for the diatessaron in the eastern branch of diatessaronic testimony and in the west in Codex Fuldensis's uh, numbers and so forth. Interesting. And and uh, those two match up in their form, which is one way to get to the diatessaron. Right. Uh, at least its format. Okay, not not the itty bitty details, but to get the basic format of the diatessaron, since there's no extant copies available, you have to look at the echoes of it. But when you look at the, the echo from the east and the echo from the west, and they line up well, you've got a pretty good idea of what the format of the Die Testament was, even though you might be able, not be able to quote it regarding the, de regarding the details. Right. Now, uh, I don't want to get into the, the weeds too, too far, because I want to get to the woman coming to Dolby. But, but, but also, you have, you have in, in the first century, excuse me, second century, Justin Martyr uh, uses some verbiage very similar to Mark 16, 20. Mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere, though, he also uses verbiage very similar to one form of Mark 16, 14. Uh, also, um, Metzger's hesitancy about affirming Justin as, you know, 
he is using Mach 1620. Mm -hmm. That's based on, and you, you can practically look at Metzger's commentary and follow along with Hort, and you can see where Metzger's reading, reading Hort and kind of borrowing a line or two from, 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 from Hort. Uh, when Hort wrote, Hort didn't have the diatessaron. The Arabic diatessaron didn't come to Hort's attention until 1888. Um, and after 1888, uh, J. Rendell Harris and uh, Frederick Chase both wrote independently, Hort's objection no longer has any basis because of what we can see from the diatessaron. Because what Hort was saying, the, the city of Jerusalem isn't named in there. It, it's not referred to there. Look at the diatessaron, and J. Riddle Harris said, as a matter of fact, Mr. Hort, it, it is in there. Just look at the diatessaron. Of course, that was you know, eight years after Hort had already published his free text. He can't really very, very well say, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, okay. So, so, so there's that. Justin, Tatian, Irenaeus. Uh, Robert Stein would throw in the Epistula Apostolorum. It, it's, a, it's a basic structure. The structure of its narrative looks like it's based on Mark 16 through 20 structure. Uh, that kind of structure we don't see in any other uh, canonical text. Hmm. So that's four from the, from the 200s. Again, Vaticanus, yeah. Sinaiticus, 300s. So you have the earliest witnesses. You have by far and away, you no. Know, when you when you throw the Vulgate copies in there, it's 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 exponential uh, for, re, regarding the uh, ending of the Gospel of Mark. But with uh with the woman called an adultery, let's turn there now. Um, there are last count and and uh, again by last by last count, this could be off by a little bit here and there because they're still discovering new manuscripts. Um, but by last count, about two hundred sixty seven, about fifteen percent of the manuscripts of John. Uh, are missing uh, John 7:53 through 8:11, yeah, through 8:11, and um, including the that early branch that's based in Egypt, the Alexandrian manuscripts, like not only not only Vaticanus, but also Sinaiticus, the early papyri, like Papyrus 66 and P75, like Codex W. Th this particular part of it is is, is Alexandrian, um, and it doesn't have the the part about the, the woman called, a, called an adultery. Uh, Codex A. Um, we don't have the exact pages of Codex A for this part of the text of John, just due to incident dam damage. But, um, but if you do the calculations and you figure, well, okay, if we figure the rest of the text was on these pages, what did the page look like? And you can do the calculations of the space considerations. And, and for both, both, both A and for C, um, it wasn't there. So in the manuscripts that look like they have an, uh, an Egyptian affiliation, uh, we don't see it. Uh, also in the Peshitta, uh, the, the uh, Syriac version, Syrian. probably made in the late late 300s. Uh, no pericorbeo and aldrig. Um, and the question comes up, well, how did this happen? Did it, did it, did it <laughs> sneak in from somewhere? Because when you look at the Greek manuscripts, not being in 15% means being in 85%. Yeah. And when we look at the Uncials, um, we see something like 17 have it, 16 don't. Huh. Two of those, like I mentioned before, two two of them have have blank space. Mm. So so when it comes to the Ancials, um, we're almost tied seventeen to seventeen. Okay. Um, and, and again, again, it kind of depends on what do you call an Ancial because one of these has well, Ancials in the text, but in between the text, there's chunks of commentary that are in minuscule. So right. so it's not like oh, this is an Ancial. It must be earlier than minuscule. It, it, it's from the minuscule era. So. So, um, so what would we do with, with the story of the woman called an adultery? How, how did it either get in or how did it get out? And, uh, and I, again, I have a research book and again, it's, it's, it's online, it's on Amazon and I'll be happy to send you a copy for free. But, uh, but the gist of my approach is to say that what happened here had involved a, a quirk in the election cycle. Now, not, not lectionary, Le lectionaries came later. But, but to, to understand what I'm saying, I'll need to explain what a lectionary is. The daily readings in the church. <laughs> yes. In a lectionary book, you have the text of the Gospels for a Gospels lectionary, obviously for, you, depending on what book you but in the case of the Gospels lectionary, you, you'd have divided up segments. It'd be like, the, this, this is the reading for today. That would be what's called the... Uh, Synaxaria, and you start on, on Easter, you'd be in John chapter 1, verse 1, you'd work through John, you, you, you'd work through different sections. You, would, you wouldn't cover every single bit that you could, 
right. and you have daily sections, just, just, just like in some books, uh, some, some Bibles, there'll be a little section. Uh, you want to read through the Bible in a year? Here's your yeah. reading for the day. Right. It, it, it's sort of like that. Um, but, uh, but instead of starting on January the 1st, it started on Easter, whatever day Easter ha would happen to be. This was called the Synaxerion. And these were called the, the movable feast because, because the days can move. You know, you'd start at Easter and then you'd be at whatever day followed from there. There was also a section called the Menologion as opposed to the Synaxerion. In the, in the Menologion, you have fixed days. It means this is the day of the year and this is what we're going to celebrate this day. And these would be things like Oh, remember when that big earthquake happened? We're so glad we survived and we've been able yeah. to rebuild the city. Let's <laughs> concentrate this special day to celebrate yeah. that day. Right. Our, you know, this is the day when we won that great battle against the enemy. Yeah. Our, they're also, this is the day when a lot of us got killed. Yeah. And, and, uh, so there, there were these kinds of things that would be in the Metalogion. Right. So there's two kinds of lectionaries. The Synaxerion, that starts at Easter and goes on from there. And the Metalogion, which is day by day throughout the year. But month, month by month, day by day. When you have a feast like Pentecost, you have that celebrated, you no, know, there's, there's, there's a way to celebrate it. Right. And uh, this was an, an issue in the early church. We, we see this, this question, when do we celebrate? Yeah, the date of Easter. Right? Easter, the date of Easter, the quarter of the Simeon controversy. And uh, we can see that going back into the second century, we, we, right. we can see, you know, Irenaeus, you'd better pay a visit to the Pope to tell yeah. him, <laughs> right. don't, don't be such a legalist about this particular point. You, you, there, there are better hills to, to die on and fight on. And so we see that it was you know, an issue in the time of Irenaeus. Um, but in the text of John, you see that uh, it, when, when you look in the lectionary, you, you see that uh, the reading for Pentecost was in John. And it began, I believe, at John 37, 47. I don't have a handy here. Uh, help me out. But um, and then when you get and, and and it's very appropriate for Pentecost because you have Jesus talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and uh, but then you get to you know, then everybody went home, and subject change. John chapter eight. You no, know, you, you don't see a lot of the same theme. And having your election, your, your reading for the day end on no prophets coming out of Galilee, kind of a down no. <laughs> yeah. But John chapter 8, verse 12, then Jesus said to, get to them, I am the light of the world. He who walks in, yeah. he who calls me shall, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the, the light of life. Very positive ending. And so we see as the reading for Pentecost begins, John chapter 7, I'm going to say 47, no. 30, 37, 37, has to be 37. Uh, John, John 37 goes to John 7, 52, then jumps down to John 8, 12. That's the meaning for Pentecost. You have this jump, and that's signified in many manuscripts. I, don't, I mean, lectionary manuscripts. I mean, in, in, in the margins of many of the medieval manuscripts, many of the ancient manuscripts, too. And, well, many is kind of a tricky term. But you see this... Uh, jump being signified by by well significations uh there's there's, there's a little little things that people would write kind of kind of a shorthand that would sim symbolize the word for today's reading start here yep. and for today's reading end here you see this in manuscripts very it's very it's a very ordinary thing to see i see yeah and uh, but you also see sometimes start here and then we'll actually go down to a certain point and say skip here skip ahead this uh yeah. This little little symbol that looks like a, a U and a P uh, means means a jump, jump ahead, and then later on, once you see a jump from here, you also see a land here or a resume here symbol. Yeah. So so in the, in the Pentecost reading, you would have a, oh, and, and you can you know, pick pick a manuscript if it's Byzantine, there's a good chance you'll you'll see these 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 in the margin. Start here for today's reading for Pentecost. Go down to here, but jump. From here, into verse 52, and then at verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 12, start here, and then finish with that. And then the, then, then the next read would, would start, would, would kind of rewind a little bit to the, to, to, to the beginning of, of 8.12, 8, because it's such a great verse. But that's, that's the, the, uh, the lection for Pentecost. Now, um, in the lectionary, it's pretty clear. It's, it, it's, it's hard to, to get lost when, when you have these symbols there. But back up 
to say the second century when Pentecost is, is being celebrated as we, we see we, we, we see it, it, it's uh, Easter it's, it, it ends up being pretty much the same thing uh, eventually but the um, picture a scribe of John who's living in a community where they celebrate Pentecost mm -hmm. and this is already the reading for Pentecost now, obviously, we don't have lectionaries that early. Lectionaries came up later. They were a development. Lectionaries got more and more complicated. Uh, the more and more people thought, this is a great idea. Uh, let's celebrate this. Let's celebrate that. That saint over there, let's celebrate that. Yeah. Uh, lectionaries grew. People right. used their continuous manuscripts as their lectionaries, and they just mark them up. Well, let's go back to the second century and picture a copyist who knows that the Pentecost lection takes this form. You begin it. 737, you go toward the end of 752, and you realize, I need to jump down here. So you say, I'm going to do the lecture a favor. I'm going to have this little note in my continuous text copy of John. And this note will say, hey, reader, reader who's in the church reading because most of us can't read, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to put this little mark here that says, jump from here at the end yep. of chapter 752, and another mark down here at the beginning of chapter 8, verse 12. What a great idea! Now the lector will not have to you know, bother saying, what, what do I do here? Do I read this section? Do I not? On, on Pentecost? Pentecost is a big day. It's a big, important feast. But before it gets to the lecture, it needs to get to a copyist. Or at some point, it needs to get to a copyist. Somebody's got to make a copy of the text at some point. This is made on papyrus. It's going to wear out. Uh, people, yeah. are not, are for whatever reason, people are going to want more copies of this book. Enter the professional copyist. Uh, some Alexandrian manuscripts are known for being professionally made. Uh, it looks like, you no, know, this wasn't just any person who, who made the manuscript. It wasn't somebody, an, an amateur. It was a professional. Mm -hmm. So picture professional manuscripts, not, not, not necessarily a Christian, just somebody who's good at his job, who, who can be trusted to make a good, accurate copy. A professional who doesn't think. The best scribes don't think. They are machines, and they just copy what's in front of them. They follow instructions. They don't think about it. They say, I will do what I'm told. Yeah. So give that copy to that kind of scribe, a meticulous scribe. He gets his copy of John. He's writing along. He's in chapter 7. What, what we know is chapter 7. They, they didn't even have the, the chapters. Yeah. He gets into chapter 7. He gets to the end of chapter 7, verse 53, and he sees this mark that says, jump ahead. Yeah. Now, of course, it's not meant for him. It's meant for the, lect for the, lect for the, it's meant for the lector. Right. But he doesn't know that. Uh, All he knows is he's got a manuscript that's telling him, skip from this point yeah. down to this point. I see. And so that's what he does. And poof, there goes the story of the adulteress in that transmission line. I see. Now, in that transmission line, it's not there. But there's a reason for that because of this glitch in the lection cycle. Interesting. Meanwhile, look outside that transmission line. Look outside of Egypt, and you'll see more evidence for the story than you, than you won't, including early patristic evidence like what we see and Jerome, yes, yes. Jerome, no, he, Jerome knew Bethlehem, Jerome knew Egypt, Jerome knew Rome, and Jerome said, I saw that story in many manuscripts, both in Greek and in Latin. Now, how many is many to Jerome? We don't know, but if it was just five, yeah. that, that would lift the number of, of manuscripts combined with the ones that are extant to, that, 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 would be, that would have the, the, uh, the, 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 the story. Interesting. So, uh, well, so, so basically, yeah. you go from this, from this glitch gap right. in the Alexandrian transmission line, and that is fairly popular. That, that, that affects other manuscripts, in, in Codex N, for instance, and it affects the, the, the Peshitta, and it could very well affect part of the, uh, the, uh, the election cycle late, later, later on. But, uh, but when we see the, t the Greek text that is not affected by that glitch, it's there. Right. What about, um, thank you for that. What about, uh, in, in terms of a couple more questions before we, we head out and I'll have all your links here below. 
what about modern translations? Which ones do you favor? For example, have you looked uh, at the Eastern Orthodox Bible that follows the the patriarchal text, or what do you think about the, the New King James and this kind of stuff? I think do, you the, a, do you have a one you favor? I, I usually preach out of the uh, New King James uh, okay. when, when when there's a, a, a reading where I say, well, that doesn't. That, that that's no. I'm not going to preach that particular reading. For, say what say in, in in Peter when Peter says, "Oh, going into salvation," I would I would make a point of saying, you know, there's a good case to be made that Peter said had had this phrase. That's why you see that footnote there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other cases, generally, it's a question of um, does this reading change the meaning of the text? Uh, if, if if a reading is just a, like a difference between he said and Jesus said, and it's still obvious who's speaking either way, I usually want to say. Okay, time out, uh, uh, dear congregation. We need to get to the bottom of whether the text should say Jesus or He. Right? Yeah. I mean, it means the same thing. Right. But there are some cases where it doesn't mean the same thing, and uh, and I, I would t- take t- take time at those particular points of the ending of the Gospel of Mark. I would say we need to explain this this footnote, and with the woman caught in adultery, uh, we need to explain this footnote. And there are other cases too. Uh, for instance, in the ESV, when you get to Matthew twelve forty seven, you don't get to Matthew twelve forty seven because it's not there, and and that is a case where it's very easy to see that there is a a tilt toward the Alexandrian text, because what is supposed to happen is when you see a case where there's an obvious trigger in the text, there's an obvious lever that cause a passage to be lost. That's probably why it was lost, especially if you're looking at a small minority of manuscripts that don't have it, and the old boring majority have it. I don't mean just no, the majority of fruit on that branch over there, but when it's in all the different branches, and just not in one branch, and yet that particular branch is held up and say, oh, this, this branch, this branch has the original text. It doesn't have Matthew, Matthew 12, 47. That's the one we're going to go with, and that's what the ESP went with. And I'm thinking, why? You can definitely see how any scribe could make a careless mistake and skip that verse by a simple parabolic error. What is a parabolic error? A parabolic error is when one word and the next word, or one phrase and the next phrase, or one paragraph and the next paragraph, in the same way. We see a verse end with exactly the same letters as the next verse, and you can easily deduce what happened. And we see this in manuscripts very frequently. The copyist lost his line of sight, and yep. he's the end of this line to the end of this line that both end in the same letters. Now, if you're focused on one line of text, you have no way to double check that. You have you have you have no base to say these manuscripts over here. We have a hundred manuscripts that have verse, two don't, and they're very closely related to each other. Why follow the shorter text in those two than all these other hundreds? And again, it's not just a matter of number. It's a matter of scope. It's multiple branches. And yet the ESV doesn't have Matthew 12, 27. Why not? Because you're using an Alexandrian base text, and the people that made the ESV and chose that base text unfairly favor the Alexandrian text at almost every point. Mm-hmm. It's called an eclectic text, but if you look at what it actually has, if you look at the actual readings in it, it's over 99% Alexandrian. If you look at particular chapters of Matthew and you run through a comparison of here's the Alexandrian readings, here's the Byzantine readings, which ones are in the base text of the ESV and the NIV and the CSB? Yeah. Alexandrian, 99% of the time, more, more than 99% of the time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, pick a chapter, do the analysis, and you will see this eclectic text sure seems like it's almost purely Alexandrian to me. Mm. There's, there's some business manuscripts read, readings through there. Some, some business manuscripts through there, but it's a teensy tiny bit. It's like saying, "Okay, you're on the team. If our quarterback breaks both his legs, and the backup quarterback breaks both his legs, and the next quarterback breaks both his legs, and the guy in the stands over there isn't willing to play, then we'll let you on the field." <laughs> right. What's a couple books that you recommend that are good introductions? Because uh, a lot of people in the audience, again, they're not going to be super familiar with uh, this kind of research. Where where do we start? What are a couple books to start with? Now we've got your lectures, but what's a, a couple places that we we can branch off book wise? Good question. 
<laughs> uh, there aren't a lot. Okay. Um, and most of the ones that are there that I would recommend are, are very, rather rather te technical. Okay. But, um, one place you could start would let be... Me, let me give you an example. Um, what about... Uh, so I read uh, Craig Blomberg's book on the, the Four Gospels. Um, I, th I thought that was pretty good. What, what do you think? Is that a good one? Um, well, Blomberg is on record um, renouncing, re rejecting uh, Mark 69 through 20. Oh, um, okay. So, so I wouldn't really I read recommend that many years ago. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't recall that. Okay. Yeah. 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 In, in, a, in an online lecture years ago at a, a, a group called scum of the earth, uh, he, he, that was online where he, he uh, was very open okay. about uh, basically saying the story of the woman from the adultery, the last one was Mark. I'm not, I'm not sure which it was, but the last, last one was Mark. Um, he was very open about saying, you know, we don't think this is original. But we're gonna put it in the Bible anyway, so those King James fanatics won't get upset. <laughs> uh, very open. But what I'd like to point out there is, really, really, Doctor, you don't think it's original, but you're willing to put it in a text that people are gonna hold in their hands and accept and think it's the Word of God, while you personally say it's not, doesn't belong yeah, there. But you, you're gonna put it there anyway. <laughs> uh, so, so I. I really couldn't recommend a whole lot by a person that has that kind yeah. of perspective. Um, what's, what's, but uh, we'll go ahead. I tell you what, uh, on, online at uh, the Curtis, CurtisvilleCC.com, uh, at that text, basic textual criticism, there's there's one of the links that has a button there for the, the Library of okay. New Testament textual criticism. Okay. There's about seventy books there. Oh wow. And they're all public domain. Some of them are editions of the Greek New Testament, oh, uh, wow. and uh, some of them are te technical books. But somewhere in between there, there are some books that that will give a Okay. An overview. Um, for, I'd say to, to see the basic modern approach that would follow from West Kind of Hort, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a group of four lectures called the St. Margaret Lectures of 1902. And uh, there, there, there are more lectures, but just those first four, I would say, are, are definitely worth reading, if for no other reason than just to get an idea of where folks are coming from when it comes right. to how do, they, how do they approach the text, how they approach the canon, uh, and, and related issues. Okay. Uh, and again, I'm not endorsing the points of view in there, but the, but the data is to, shows to, to, right to, to, to just to get some grounding on the issues to know what 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 are the questions that are being talked about. Right. That would be a, a good place to start. Also, there's a book called the uh, the English Hexapla. It's like very old. It's well, not very old, but but it's from 1840. Uh, old, old by, by most standards. Right. And um, for for for, for a printed book, and um, it gives a very thorough introduction. It also has a, a Greek New Testament in there. Okay. But uh, but with before that though, it introduces the history of the English Bible, and probably that's what most of the people that are gonna watch this would. Right. Would, we'll that, that, that's how most people are gonna contact the Bible in English, and that gives a very very, very nice, um, you know, probably not perfect, but 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 still a very informative uh, introduction to how did the Bible in English get started, what texts were used, and uh, how did how did that bring us up to the King James Version. Right. Excellent. Obviously, it's 1840, so it's not going to talk about West Cotton Horde. It's not going to talk about the ESV or anything like that. But uh, that is a great place to start. Well, definitely. Yeah. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Snap. I much, much appreciate it. I'm honored to have you on, and I'll have all your links below. And anything you want to leave us with? Um, again, feel free to email me at james.snap at gmail.com, uh, two Ps in Snap. And uh, if you request uh, my book on Mark 16, 9 through 20, on my book on the woman, story of the woman called in adultery, I'll be happy to send them to you for free. Okay. And um, I am uh, putting on a series of lectures on YouTube. There's a link at the church's website, curtisvillecc.com. And uh, along with ser some sermons in there, there, there are a growing series of lectures that I'm making. Uh, I'm just at the edge of it now, uh, but, but I hope that will become a, a full series introducing uh, the field of New Testament textual criticism. And you, and, uh, by the way, if, if, if anybody's wondering, uh, I'm not TR only, I'm not Byzantine only. Okay. Uh, my approach is described in one of, one of my online uh, lecture pieces okay. that I give there. You can easily find the link if you go there and look for look for equitable eclecticism. Okay. By equ equitable eclecticism, I simply mean it's an eclectic approach. It considers all lines of evidence. Right. Uh, Alexandrian, Western, Byzantine, family one. The versions, right? But it doesn't involve Hort's theory that 
the Byzantine text is a made text. I consider the Byzantine text to have you know, a few readings simply that where one text type grabbed up against another text type and you get a conflict reading. But that doesn't mean there's not this mass of readings over here that want a result of rubbing up against this type or that type. Right. Uh, there's this huge uh, body of like everywhere from, from, from Greece to Antioch where you know, we don't have the, early, the kind of early attestation that we have in the Alexandrian text because of the weather. But as soon as the text shows up, we right. definitely have this core, a very large Byzantine core to consider as an equally ancient text. Now, you, you said it really fast, so could you say it just a little bit slower? You're saying Curtisville CC, is that what you're saying? Yes, Cur Curtisville CC, as in Christian Church. Okay. Uh, Curtis, CurtisvilleCC.com. Okay, gotcha. And there's a link there that takes you to the YouTube videos. And the studies. There's a, there's a button that takes you to the textual criticism resources. And once you're at the text, the, the, the page of textual criticism resources, you get a page full of buttons. And uh, you can just okay. scroll down. It's, I try to divide it into, into, into columns. One column will have reviews of things. So like, is the message a real Bible? You want to find out about the message? Yeah. There's a link. You want to find out about the Passion Translation? There's a link. You want to find out a, a review of various books on the subject that, that have come out? There's links. Excellent. Uh, sec second column uh, focuses on individual manuscripts. Uh, every now and then I'll, I'll take a little tour of a particular manuscript and, and describe right. it. And, okay. uh, and, and then the third column, I, I should be going this way, shouldn't I? The, the, <laughs> third, column, the third column is uh, particular passages that I've investigated in my blog. And uh, this isn't all of them, but just some of the major hits, you could say. Um, Mark chapter 1 verse 2, people ask about that. Mark chapter 1 verse 41, people ask about that. Um, obviously the woman called adultery and, and uh, the ending of Mark, those are both there. Um, I made special pages in that list and, all, and again all you do is click the button and it will take you there. For, for, for the comma, for the ending of Mark, and for the woman called adultery there are special resource pages. And part of the reason for those resource pages is that there is so much misinformation right. about those particular points. Uh, yeah. Especially the woman called an adultery, and especially, yeah. especially the ending of Mark. Exactly. There's some much information in there that half the research is correcting mistakes that are being circulated online by, for instance, Dan Wallace, James White. Uh, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg, and um, that's why I have the links there. So, so but, but, but there's oodles of misinformation, and you'll find it corrected there. Excellent. Obviously, I couldn't correct it all because I'm mortal. <laughs> um, last question. Do you know of a, what's a good uh, Harmony of the Gospels that you can think of? Is there a good one you'd recommend? Um, well, the, the, old, the old Burton Harmony, when you say Harmony of the Gospels, you mean like a new edition? Well, yeah, that, that's dealing with, uh, in terms of apologetics, you know, you kind of have these, these standard things that are recycled in apologetics about, well, what about the accounts of, you know, the Gadarene demon? What about this and what oh. about that? Um, I would probably go back to 1876 for, for apologetics purposes, just to, to, to if, if a person would want to, to lay the foundation, mm -hmm. um, there's a alleged discrepancies of the Bible yeah. by a man whose name starts with H, uh, off the top of my head. Um, but I, I would start, you know, read through that. And then once you still have questions, then start delving into the tall, the tall grass. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Snap. And all of your links will be below this video. And uh, I look forward to maybe in the future, we can have you back and have some more uh, discussions on these topics. All right. I, I look forward to that. All right. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. much.